Hey, it's, uh, it's Sunday night in Bonaire. We had a, a good service this morning. Man, I was up at the 8 o'clock <laughs> service this morning. I missed everybody in the 10. Yeah, I mean, it was 8.30, well, yes, because I text, what about the 8 o'clock service? <laughs> <laughs> I was so did we cancel the 8 o'clock service? No, we just postponed it to 8.30. 8.30 <laughs> kind of thing. All right, Pastor, you were in Matthew chapter 3, the, the first 12 verses of it. Uh, I, I've got that question, but I know you already know my first beginning question. So give us a synopsis of this and, and throw out something that maybe have caught your eye. Okay, well, the synopsis is we, we left the infancy narrative, which is chapters 1 and 2, went into the introduction to the public ministry of Jesus, and all four Gospels introduce it with John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist, we talked about his message, two, two issues in his message, uh, repent, which is an, uh, an, an ethical call, and the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which is a uh, a notice of the last days have arrived. Yeah. Um, then we kind of broke that down into what the repentance meant, and I'm sure we can talk more about that in the okay. panel. Uh, we moved on to the kingdom of heaven that meant the king is near, the king is at hand. Uh, then the second thing was uh, John's response to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, mm. uh, which is very interesting. And We spent uh, some time in that. Yeah, we, we talked yeah. about that, and we explained who the Sadducees and mm -hmm. Pharisees were. And then the third thing is John compares his ministry to Jesus, uh, the, the I-He comparison. And essentially he says what he does uh, in the other Gospels. I'm here, but I'm, I point to him. Right. He's greater. As, as John says, he must increase, mm -hmm. I must decrease. Wow. So then, the, 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 okay, what did I see in the text that I had not seen before? Um, I, th I think... I, the question that I ask, and I was talking to Bo about this afterwards, the question that I ask, okay, why did Israel need to repent? Because what I specifically saw was that this message was for Israel. Mm -hmm. He's preaching to the Jews. Okay, so why did they need to repent? And that's what really kind of caught my eye as I went through it for the first time, or it caught my eye this time around. I've been through it many, many times. Great question. Great question. Why did they need to repent? Yeah. Did you answer it for yourself? <laughs> I, I answered it for myself. I, I, if you want to go ahead with that. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> I, I, they needed to repent because their religion was external. External. Exactly. It was all about uh, rituals and, and uh, all this, this, this really ironic thing. They had made everything about the law, their meticulous keeping of the law, the meticulous rules about the law and all of this. But the fact is they never could keep the law. Okay, all right. Steve, you were there. What, yeah. what, what was it in the sermon that you hadn't seen before as you read the text? There was quite a few, actually. And okay. uh, one of the things that stood out clearly, the need for Israel to repent, um, and John baptizing uh, uh, the Jews. Um, another thing, as you were kind of wrapping things up towards the end, and John's preaching or his ministry, focusing solely on Christ. Focusing on, focusing on the kingdom of God, not being swayed or influenced by politics, um, the hot topics at the moment, things like that, but him focusing on Christ. And just a reminder to me that um, regardless, um, uh, think what I'm saying, what I'm doing, does it exalt the king? Does it exalt Jesus? Um, what I'm doing, is it focused on Christ? And I kind of think kind of ties back to your, uh, the video you did over the weekend. And just a challenge in me in my life to regardless of what I'm doing, is this focusing on Christ? This is, does this exalt Christ? So that was a huge takeaway for me. Um, another takeaway, I, a lot, I got a lot out of the sermon today. Um, just a reminder of the theme of uh, uh, Matthew and the constant, uh, pointing back to the Old Testament and fulfillment of the Old Testament. And the last thing truly stood out to me with uh, uh, John the Baptist being mentioned in all the Gospels. Um, there's a few things that are mentioned within all the Gospels, um, feeding of the 5,000, um, the uh, Jesus being in the garden, um, uh, the prediction of Judas and Peter's betrayal and the fulfillment of that, um, Jesus' trial. And you look at those uh, huge things, and John's mentioned as well in all four. And so that really stood out to me. Yeah. Um, but there within. was some practical application for you right there, especially on the focus. What Absolutely. are you focusing on? Absolutely. Okay, wow. Brother Bo? 
Well, one thing to talk about what Steve was saying there, I, I think the fact that John the Baptist is mentioned in all four Gospels, it, you know, he, we, you know, he may be kind of an undervalued person that we see in Scripture. His ministry, you know, is is over. I say over. He's he inaugurates, I guess, um, prepares the way for Jesus, and then he's kind of steps in the back, and Jesus is the focus. So he can be kind of underappreciated, but. Um, really, when I did a, a study on him before, you can just see that the Old Testament turns into the New Testament with John the Baptist. You're not really with the birth of Jesus, but it's the birth of John the Baptist. Okay. Um, that, uh, you know, it's like the hinge where it just turns from the old to the new. I know um, R.C. Sproul, he asked, he asked like a trick question of his seminary students. He said, he would ask him, well, who's the greatest prophet in the Old Testament? And they'd give some answers, Elijah or, or Isaiah or whatever. And he would say, John the Baptist. And then they would reply, well, he's in the New Testament. Yeah, we're still under the old covenant. The new covenant hasn't been inaugurated yet. That's exactly right. Yeah. And anyway, it, it can be kind of uh, maybe underappreciated to that degree. Because, okay. and because Jesus flat out said of persons born of women, there's no one greater than John the Baptist. That's right. That's a, that's a good uh, resume right yeah. there. Yeah. It's almost like Job's, right? Mm -hmm, right? Have you looked at my servant? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. That's awesome. Uh, Pastor, let's talk a little bit about that intertestinal period. We're talking about, uh, what, 400 years that we haven't heard a prophet. Uh, and what developed, you talked about what developed out of that was the Sadducees and the Pharisees. You, you hit that pretty hard today that uh, uh, these guys were were developed during that time period. Now, when we know them in the New Testament, right, we, we know them as uh, <clears throat> vipers <laughs> and stuff like that. But before that, they had a function that was good. They did. Uh, and how did that how did that move to from a good function to a brood of vipers? That's a really good question. That's a really good question. Uh, let's just talk about the inter intertestamental period just for a few seconds. Okay. Uh, this period that goes essentially the, the prophecies shut down at Malachi. Right. And, of course, God doesn't shut down. God is busy. Providence is going on. Right. I think about the four statues of Daniel chapter 2. or the, Not the four statues, but the, the statue That's with true. the four medals. Right. And so you're going progressively through these empires, the Babylonian Empire, Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire, and and the the Persian, Greek, and Roman all happened during this intertestamental it's, period. Yeah. I mean, uh, right. it, it's certainly at the 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 end of the Old Testament because you have Ezra and Nehemiah in the Persian period, but right. but still it, it goes it, it bleeds on over until the Persians are defeated by the Greeks, and so during that time when the Greeks defeat the Persians, uh, Alexander the Great is uh, the, the king and after his death it's divided up between two of his generals the Seleucids and the Ptolemies okay. yeah. and Antiochus becomes the real evil guy for the Jews and, and so they're under the, the, the power of the Ptolemies and so Antiochus Epiphanes offends them greatly and there's a revolt and it's led by the Maccabee family, uh, several of them. And, and during that time, uh, a lot happens, and John Hyrcanus comes to power, and, and he shifts the priesthood in the temple during that time. And so a group arises that says, no, this is the wrong priesthood. It should go back to Zadok. Right. And these become the Sadducees. Right. Because so, they, they want to keep it pure. Yeah, right? and it, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. The other thing is the Hasidim, this idea of, of purity of the law. Right. The Pharisees become the offspring of the Hasidim movement, the purity of the law. Again, a very good movement. Because if you break the law, I mean, you're going back into captivity, exactly. right? Exactly. And so, that was their great fear. So how did they go wrong? <laughs> Because they put more right. emphasis on the letter of the law right. than the spirit of the law. Uh -huh. And they, they lost God right. in the whole process. They lost God and, and the 
the, the written stuff and, and, and their reputation and their temple and all these things became their idols. So, so you had the Pharisees being traditionalist. Yeah, I would yeah. say so. And, yeah. and then you had Sadducees being more progressive and temple-minded, which very means temple -minded. taxes, which is uh, uh, you, you had to buy your sacrifice from them as well. Yeah. I mean, the, ooh, the temple was a business. Big time. Big time business. 25% so of Jerusalem's economy. economy was off that temple. Mm -hmm. So you have a progressive, uh, you, you have something that started out really good. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful exactly. about that ourselves, don't we? We do. Starting exactly. out really good, then it becomes something really bad. And it seems us. to happen every time. I mean, all of us love Spurgeon. Oh, yes. But look what happened to Spurgeon's church. Look what oh. happened in time. I mean, it's, it's just, it seems to be one of those things. It's almost just set in stone that what, what happens is going to digress. These great movements are going to digress, and it's, it's very sad. So we come to this point, and all of a sudden, as you said today, John the Baptist suddenly appears. He appears. All right, let's talk about that for a little bit. We, we've got 400 years of, of no prophet. What, what, what makes this significant? What, what, what is it here? Well, I guess I'll go first. Um, it's, it's just the fact that there, there is a prophet now. And always with Israel, okay, is this a true prophet or is it a false prophet? Okay. Okay? All right. I never thought about it that way, but absolutely. And I'm just even still looking at it. I mean, even getting, I'm jumping ahead a bit, but looking at his message, again, they're looking at it from a standpoint of silence and then hey, repent, the kingdom is at hand. And so just looking at it from the message, uh, the prophet's back or the prophet is here. And then his message going along with it is something that's clear that uh, uh, was a huge or something that's big that stood out to me. And I think okay. Brother Bob, what do you think? Well, one thing, if I could comment on what Kenny was saying earlier, you know, I guess with the Pharisees, they developed this almost religion of self-righteousness and pride. And for John the Baptist to prepare the way of the Lord, he has to overcome or he has to speak against their self-righteousness and their pride. And he's preparing the way for the Lord and to, for them to, I guess, recognize that. But what kind of struck me as I was reading over some, some uh, commentary on this is that really, though, you can say that's how God works today. That we, today, we can, if we don't acknowledge that we are, you know, sinners in need of a Savior, if we rely on whatever marriage or whatever else, it, it, we, would, we really need, I guess, for, we need the Holy Spirit to prepare the way that recognize that we are lost and in need of a savior, that we, we are not, you know, we can't rely on our self-righteousness or that our standing before God in any, because of our merits or anything that, uh, you know, we have to, I guess the Holy Spirit prepares the way for the Lord to take away that false notion, that false idea in our minds, just like John the Baptist had to confront before Jesus began his ministry. That even though we kind of look at the Pharisees as being that way, I mean, Today, it's not, you know, it's a need of people before they can become Christians right. to recognize they are not sufficient in themselves. This right. is a conversation that Steve and I have had a lot, too. This whole thing of people don't realize how convoluted self-righteousness is. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. This whole idea of, of, like, virtue signaling the day and, and calling people out and, and, and t telling people how superior you are. That is, is dangerous. I mean, it, you're putting yourself in a place you don't want to be. And I, even as a pastor, you know, I, I try to ask people questions and show people things, but I dare some call people out. I, and I will tell them what the Bible says. The Bible says repent and believe, or mm -hmm. else he stands there with a winnowing, winnowing fork, as it says in we, verse 12. We're going to talk about this. Yeah, I mean, that, this is ugly. that is the message, but it's not for me to be the one to to condemn or say, look at me, be like me. Oh, no, look to Jesus. Yeah, he, 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 didn't, he didn't use that. No. In fact, I, I, that bothered me when you said he suddenly appeared. Yeah. I was like, huh. So I went back and researched it. Uh, Zechariah talked about the prophet's hiding, not wearing the clothes of a prophet, not eating the diet of a prophet, and even if I have a prophetic word, I, I, you know, I'm a farmer. Yeah. 
Yeah, and we have 400 years of that. And, and Matthew basically says, this guy's intentionally wearing the camel's hair, he's wearing the leather belt, and he's eating locusts, and he is calling people out. Yes. I mean, this is a, if we can say it in our culture, this is a bold, ugly sermon. My grandparents would have said something like, ooh, he is stomping on the toes today <laughs> kind, of, kind of sermon. But he's speaking so, to the people who think they are on God's chosen. Yes, he, he is. And, and he is doing some ugly calling out. Judgment is yeah. one of the things that he's talking about. And, and, and I thought about this for a second. We live much in the culture of the Romans and Jewish of the time of this scripture where everything was okay except those who, few, who refused to get along. Yeah. So I, I, when I look at this text, I mean that text is, when you start calling a Sadducee and a Pharisee vipers. And, and, and particularly the offspring of vipers because they're saying we're the offspring of Abraham. Ooh, He's saying, man. no, no, you're so the offspring of the serpent. Yeah. Now, I, wow. when's the last time you heard a sermon like that? Uh, Pastor, I'm not, uh, I, 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 I'm talking about myself. I preached today myself. Uh, last time I heard a sermon was Dr. E.B. Hill. I remember him well. Oh, my soul. If, do you know who he was? Oh, yeah, you got he was a just, black preacher from Watts. Okay. Oh, my oh God. powerful preacher. Really I, I got awesome. to meet him two or three times. Did you really? Yes, it was awesome. But I remember being at, in Dallas at, uh, forget the church, and I really was, I mean, it's ugly. <laughs> and it's like, don't look to the left or to the right because somebody might be pointing at you. In fact, I started to pick up my cell phone and ask my wife, hey, did you talk to Dr. Hill about this? I mean, it's the kind of sermon that I'm, I'm taking this up. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. I mean, as I was reading through and just hearing his words, and you had brought it up this morning, and who he's speaking to, uh, the... Uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, and uh, the I was looking at it, the love of God that it took to say what he said, mm. the fear of God it took for him to oh, say wow. what he said, yeah, the courage it took for him to say what he said. It's, oh he's goodness. not just speaking to, you know, Joe Blow in a corner. Uh, uh -huh. He's speaking to the leaders and speaking it with boldness, with courage. And again, I, I'll keep foot something, the love of God and the fear of God for him to say what he said it truly said yeah he could have been less offensive but not presented the truth yeah, you know absolutely. i mean i'd rather rather know the truth and and if you know especially if you're doing something wrong you want to be warned rather mm -hmm. than somebody just fear to offend you Why? but then when you preach you don't want to just be you know it, <laughs> we're especially in doctrine yeah with yeah. that now you speak yeah. the truth in love but right. speak right. the yeah. truth and john wanted if you think about his motives his motive, I think, was I want the people to be prepared for the Messiah. Messiah. Yeah, exactly. uh, this is this is a judgment seminar. And I, I went home and looked at the in verse eight. I, I went home and looked at that word. Uh, bring forth, rep, uh, bring forth food. John is not wanting you to go home and think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, take a couple of days, pray <laughs> with the Lord about this. You know, see how it settles in your soul. That's an heir's tense. He wants repentance and fruit immediately. That's a, that's, a, that's a powerful sermon in a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's just going for the fence on this. And, True. And, 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 and people are coming to hear this. They hadn't heard anything like it in a while. That's true. And I'll yeah, since 400 years. 400 right? years. <laughs> yeah, this is 400 years, and, and he is really, I mean, he's calling people, that you need to be a, a repentant. I just had an aha uh -huh. moment, too, just listening to what Steve and Bo were saying. Mm -hmm. I think, too, that John, when he looked, and, and he's preparing the way for Jesus, he's thinking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. I think that John knows that, that the Messiah that he's preaching this, prepara this pre preparatory message for is going to conflict with the Sadducees and Pharisees. It's got to. 
He's yeah. got to know that. It's society, he, he knows it's going to con conflict with, s with the leadership. But I bet he also knows after preaching that that it's going to meet the people where they're at. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right, I, I, I took too much time on that, but I want to come back. You did some comparison, uh, comparison baptisms. Mm -hmm. uh, you also did some comparison of ministry. So let's talk through those comparisons if you want to. Well, just the, this, the ritual washing that the Jews went through to kind of signify, you know, that... Uh, the old was washed off and the new was being initiated. It was more or less an initiatory rite for, for proselytes. The Qumran community was doing baptism because they were in this repentance mode and in this uh, back to the basics kind of thing. Okay. Uh, but John's baptism is different because it required confession. And, and he administers it. I, again, that's something that I have not focused on before when I looked at this text. There was a lot of things that really... In God's providence, jumped out at me of this text this time that had not before. Okay. You mean the the, the external versus the internal? Oh the yeah. Joke, and I see that clearly clearly with the washings versus the baptism. Mm. Um, again, the confession. It takes a lot to, for me to come out and confess and repent compared to the external of a washing. So something is just clear. Um, the clear difference in the two, just the um, the washings and versus the uh, actual baptism and the uh, some of the things was lean, reading um, in preparation, just looking forward, and the identification with Christ, the death, uh, burial, and resurrection with baptism. Again, looking forward, um, just a clear difference in the uh, uh, between the uh, washings versus the baptism. Okay, for the both. Well, one thing that just struck me was we were talking about baptism, but you know, a lot of times in the Old Testament, the prophets wouldn't just speak, but they would have some act to to that would convey some truth in them what they're speaking. And that, I mean, that baptism, again, if you think of John the Baptist being um, an Old Testament prophet, I mean, it was, there, it was just rich in symbolism. I mean, that, as we talked about this morning, the water itself didn't save or cleanse per se, but it was a picture of, of all of that. I mean, he, they confess before they were baptized, and then obviously, you know, Jesus identifies with um, his people by being baptized, and then we're taught obviously when we'll we get converted to be baptized so you know I mean I know it's used elsewhere but at the baptism mm -hmm. you know but it does seem to be uh, I mean it's just a lot in one act of uh, one picture that conveys a lot of depth of meaning really okay what about this issue with uh, don't think being a child of father Abraham where are we at with that is that a wake-up call for them? Absolutely. And it's something that they just harbored and, and clung to, this idea that we're okay because we're chosen in Abraham. So there's no need for repentance because we're exactly. there's nothing to repent no, from. Exactly. We're going the right direction. That's the right we're direction. Is there anything applicable about that today? Oh, I think for sure. I, uh -huh. Oh, man. Oh, I, I'll let you go with that. You're good on the application. Uh -huh. and, but even in that, and uh, like I was saying last week, uh, I was doing Steve's Lawson's study on Romans, and um, it took me about a month and a half in Romans 11, and um, Paul hammered that, I mean, just repeatedly, um, the, uh, the identity, um, uh, uh, the having being declared righteous or being righteous from the identity of Abraham, who's the ethnic Jew. Um, and things like that. So I think it's clear, and you're seeing that in Matthew, then even more so, as Paul's pointing it out in Romans, and I think it's a reminder on us, and again, everything comes back to Christ, plain and simple. My identity is in Christ. There's nothing else. Um, everything else is secondary, or everything is else is beneath that. My identity is in Christ. And so, so something that was just clear to me as in looking at that. Um, um, I think you can see that in uh, a lot of relationships today. Um, just an example, I plead daily for God to save my children. It doesn't matter what daddy's relationship with God. They have to uh, meet Jesus for themselves. And the same thing, in a sense, their identity, yes, they were ethnic Jews, but they still need salvation. That salvation is in Christ and Christ alone. There's something that's clear within that. Okay. Amen. All right. Yeah. Brother Bo? 
It really, really, really points out too that it's individualistic. It's uh, every individual's need to repent and be baptized. You can't just cling to, you know, being part of the family or, or you know, raised in a Christian home or Christian church. It's, American. Yeah, that's right. It's individualistic, and mm -hmm. I guess that's one distinction with um, John the Baptist ministry versus an Old Testament prophet, because they're they're preaching to the um, speaking to the people almost as a nation that God's going to judge the nation unless we repent um, and and John the Baptist is pretty much individualistic that the you know the kingdom of heaven is near it's not the Israel's kingdom is the heavenly kingdom and it's individualistic and personal salvation and I don't know that is a difference in focus That's an excellent observation yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it really is we, we, we tend to identify with groups so much right that we forget we stand before God as individuals. The group, our group identity is not going to save us. Our national affiliation is not going to save us. You know, in the 50s and 60s in this country, there was, there was a lot of patriotic Christianity where mm -hmm. people thought, you know, I'm an American, and even though I may not be affiliated with the church or whatever, I'm, I'm okay because I'm in the group. And we don't, we're not... We don't stand before God as justified or condemned as a group. We stand before God as justified or condemned as individuals. Right. That's a revolutionary yeah. thing, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> it Especially is. in this world where we where we live now, everybody's going to heaven. Yeah. I mean, there is no judgment. What, 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 how can that be? And and that message of John is relevant today. Absolutely. It is. I mean, you can't get by it. And he uses some great imagery of what's going to happen in the end. He uses two, two things. He uses the axe to the tree and the shovel to the wheat or to the shucks of corn, however you want to look at it. And, and in the end, what's going to happen? It's going to separate good from the bad and that that yeah. does bear fruit and that that does not bear fruit right the, the tree that doesn't bear you're done cut down yes it's it's over with uh, the fruit is away from that which is useless and the, and the call is what repent repent and demonstrate some fruit is uh, bear 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 fruit that shows repentance Acts 26, 26. 26. Mm -hmm. repent unto God and do works that give evidence of repentance. Absolutely. And the question has always been for me as I deal with this personally and what you're talking about application, is there stuff daily that Brother Bo could con convict me of being a Christian other than my word? If I stood before him as a judge, is there any evidence and sometimes in the day, I wonder, what did I do today? Even in the dirty work I have to do for the government, was there evidence that I'm a Christian in doing that ugly work? I don't know how many of us struggle with that. I think we all struggle, if we're honest, we all struggle with our walk with God, and at the end of the day, we're glad that we're saved by grace. Right. Grace that was brought to us, and repentance was a fruit even of that grace. That we repented was a fruit of that grace. And, and so that's, that's our struggle. I, I thought about this as John sits in jail. John is wondering, did I do the right thing? And so how does he confirm if he did the right thing or not? He asked Jesus. There you go. Yeah, and again, that was, he was a lot, well, circumstances caused him those doubts, obviously. I mean, mm -hmm. and, you know, he's in prison and, and death may be imminent, and he's like, well, the kingdom is heaven and near. This is how it's going to look. You know, is evil prevailing? And is this right? I mean, you just think how Jesus responded. I mean, he, obviously, John the Baptist did right with it. In his doubt, he went to Jesus, or right. he mm -hmm. sent messengers to Jesus. Um, and you think about Jesus' response to him. He didn't rebuke him. 
the oh ye of little faith, faith or yeah. by the way, you said you know behold the lamb of god yeah. who takes away the sins what's that now yeah, yeah i mean he it, it, what is it you know bruised reed he will not break and, yeah. and john was bruised you know he's in prison and he just tell him what you see tell him what you observe tell him the facts tell him this is reality his circumstances is not they're not changing reality it wasn't a rebuke it was a word of encouragement in the end right yeah, yeah. and you know and it been you just think about John the Baptist too, though. I mean, he was killed in prison, so he kind of falls within the Hebrews 11, where mm. the prom he didn't get to see the fulfillment of the promises, That's but he true. lived by faith. That's true. You know, and uh, you know, this. It's amazing the Holy Spirit didn't list him in that category, but maybe he's in the broad category at the end of that passage where it says, and, and the world didn't deserve these. Right, yeah. yes, when Paul gets that high mm. note, almost like singing, yes, yeah, yeah. that is awesome. Mm. And, yeah. Well, you know, uh, we've had a good time together. I have so enjoyed this. My wife asked me, are you always conscious of what's going on? And I'm like, there's some part of it that uh, this is just fun. Yeah, <laughs> just that's fun. true. Pastor, we, we uh, need to draw this to an end. So I'm, I'm going to ask you to uh, make some last uh, thoughts or impressions and then tell us what direction you're going next Sunday and uh, probably close us out in prayer if you don't mind. Well, I don't think there's much I can add to what's been said tonight. It's been a, a, a great discussion. Uh, I wish we could do another 30 or 40 minutes. I, I've so enjoyed all of you and your thoughts on this. Um, Next week, and I, I thought about this, Steve, and I, it's broken my heart, but uh, before I knew you were leaving, I had asked somebody to speak for me next week, so today was my last sermon with you, and I'm, mm. I'm brokenhearted about that. I really am. I, if, I could, if I could have a fast plane, I'd like to start a satellite church and, you know, up around the fort and, and uh, be with you. It, it has been, I just want to say this, it, it has been a delight to be with you, and uh, I, I know that we'll stay in touch. Uh, so I, I think we're going to have a kind of a special panel next week, and the, the subject will be up in there. I'm going to ask Steve to, to join us again just for the last time. You can join us one more week. You're leaving the first, I think. I, may, I don't know what uh, clothes I'll have. The movers come on Friday. <laughs> but, uh, well, uh, uh, yeah, if, if you can get on an airplane with them, you can come <laughs> to this discussion with them, I'm sure. <laughs> so uh, anyway, but we'll, we'll work that out. Uh, and uh, so that's... That's where we are, and the, then the few weeks after that, we'll be having some different speakers, and actually the two of you will be speaking. So, yeah. <laughs> so, there you go. And not at Marshallville, Bon Air. <laughs> okay. Steve, would you close us in prayer tonight? Gracious God, our King, our Lord, uh, we thank you for this time uh, to be able to just engage and talk about your word. Uh, Thank you uh, for your word, which uh, encourages us, which gives us strength, which convicts us, which draws us to you, uh, which strengthens us. God, we just thank you so much for who you are and uh, what you've done in our lives, Lord, uh, uh, most importantly for uh, your son and for uh, drawing us to you, to you and saving us, God. And God, as we leave here, Lord, let's just be reminded, um, as uh, John was focused on uh, the Messiah, on the kingdom, let us be focused on you and exalting your name, uh, letting the world know who you are, Lord, in our word and in our actions, God. We thank you. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.